Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being in your place this morning. And uh, let's stand together. We're going to have a, a time of prayer as we begin. And uh, this is the day that the Lord hath made. You know how that verse ends, don't you? And we will rejoice and be glad in it. And it's always good to remind ourselves that this is the day that God has given to us and that we want to use this day uh, for his honor, for his glory, and we're asking him uh, to accomplish that in our midst this morning. And uh, what a great day it's going to be today. We're going to have um, several missionaries that will be presenting their works. Uh, one of them we currently support, the other will uh, we'll take on for support by the end of the day today, and uh, it's going to be just a great day. I'm so thankful that you're here uh, to be able to uh, participate in this with us, and uh, we're asking God to get all the honor and all the glory, all right? Let's bow together for prayer, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we ask that you would use your word in our hearts and lives. Father, this morning as we, Father, hear from these missionaries and the work that Father, is happening around the world. I pray that you would, Father, ignite a passion in our heart to see you work right here in our midst with our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends, our family. Father, and I pray that we not only have a greater desire to see people around us accept you as their Savior. Father, but I pray that you would show us how we might, Father, leverage all that you've given to us for the sake of the gospel around the world. Father, I pray that you'd show me the way in which you would have me to use the resources, the opportunity, Father, the life that you've given to me, Father, to see the gospel, Father, go all around the globe. Father, we thank you for our missionaries that are with us. Father, we ask that you would just fill them with your spirit. I pray that they would, Father, understand that they're with, Father, friends. Father, we love them. We are so thankful for them. Father, we count it an honor that they would be with us, your choicest servants, Father, I pray that they would experience not just the love of First Baptist Church toward them, but they would, Father, experience your love toward them through us. Father, and I pray that you would, Father, get the honor and the glory from all that we do and all that we say. Father, thank you for those that you've gathered together this morning. I pray that your spirit would be, uh, Father, obeyed. I pray that your word would be preached, and I pray that your name would be glorified. Father, we think of those in our church family who are sick or whether perhaps struggling with uh, their health in some way, perhaps, Father, too afraid to, to get out of the house. Father, I pray that you would give them comfort. I pray that you give them strength, and I pray that you'd give them grace. Your word says that your grace is sufficient for us. Father, so we pray that your grace would be sufficient for whatever situation we find ourselves in this morning. I pray that we'd have our eyes turned to your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that we would see him high and lifted up. And I pray, Father, that you would, Father, do a work in our hearts so that when we leave this place in just a little while, Father, we might, Father, be renewed and refreshed and strengthened in our faith. Father, we ask all these things according to the name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's by his name that we pray. And all the church said together, amen. amen. Thank you so much for standing. You may be seated. Onward. 
All righty. Well, it's great to see you this morning. And we have uh, two missionaries that I, I am so excited to have with us. Uh, the first is certainly no stranger uh, to First Baptist Church and to Long Beach. And I'm certain you'll, uh, you'll find a, a familiarity with him as well. But it's fantastic to have Pastor Esposito with us. And uh, I was catching up with him in the hallway. And I, and I tell you, I love his energy, his love for the Lord, and his understanding of the scriptures and what the Lord has called us to do uh, as it relates to evangelizing the world. And I tell you, church family, we are, we are blessed to be able to partner uh, with Pastor Esposito and the great work that's happening in Southeast Asia. And uh, I, I'm looking for a microphone here. Brother uh, or Derek, I'm going to use this red one. If, is that okay? And uh, Brother Esposito, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for the great work that you're doing. And we're certainly glad uh, to have you a part of our missionary family. You come and you greet the church family. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Boy. I am very thankful for this pulpit. Somebody say amen. Uh, one of the most discouraging things about being in America, the size of the pulpits. And normally they're about like this. And Trying to reach over. Uh, this is uh, a man size right here. It is a joy to be here today. Of course, uh, we're friends, neighbors. I was on staff at Pacific Baptist Church, Long Beach, California for 18 years. Spoke here many, many times. We're thankful for uh, your prayers, your financial support. Remember the good old days when I used to coach our basketball team and played against your guys? Well, they weren't always good days. But anyway. I, Pastor, thank you for allowing us to be here. My wife and I, by the way, my wife is with the grandchildren right now, but uh, my wife and I have been serving in Asia for the last seven and a half years. Uh, during that seven and a half year period of time, we have lived and served in the country of Laos, where we presently reside in, for four and a half years. And uh, it's a communist country, no missionaries allowed. Everything we do is sort of under the radar. Uh, we don't carry our Bibles in public. They're always in a backpack, uh, that type of thing. You're just not going down the street. You're not knocking on doors. You're not passing out tracks. But we've seen, we've planted three churches. Uh, we've started an English school. We have a Bible college. We call it School of Ministry, 21 students, uh, preparing them for full-time Christian service. I actually make it four churches. We just planted another church during COVID. Somebody say amen. Uh, one of the men that I've been discipling for quite some time started a church about four months ago since we've been here. And we're excited about what God's doing. We also spent two years in the country of Cambodia. God's doing some amazing things there. Uh, in Cambodia, you have the freedom. Of course, you know, uh, Brother Chad, he was there, and I knew him when he was there. Uh, but uh, we have the freedom to share the gospel, pass out tracts and everything. God's doing some amazing things in Cambodia. Then we spent almost a year in China. And uh, again, communist country, uh, definitely tightening the screws. But... Uh, my seven and a half years, uh, I spent 30 years in the ministry here in America. My seven and a half years in Asia, basically, primarily, I have been discipling and mentoring uh, national pastors, uh, church leaders, potential church leaders, prospective church leaders. Most of my ministry is about that. And I've uh, just spent a lot of time training men uh, for the ministry and then saying, the things that somebody gave me, the Apostle Paul taught this in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2, Even me, I find faithful men. I found you. I gave it to you. Now you go out and do what you've been taught from the word of God. Somebody say amen. The video that you're going to see, a short video, about five-minute video, is just sort of a highlight pictures from China, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand. We do a lot of ministry in Thailand. Uh, Myanmar, I think we have some of Indonesia there. But thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. Thank you for loving. And let me say this. Please, uh, let me ask this. Please pray for us. We were supposed to go back in August. And uh, the international borders are locked. We can't get in the country. And uh, once we do get in the country, it's interesting. It'll take six weeks of quarantine in three different countries to get in, get back home. But we, we do covet your prayers because we, we love our people. We no longer consider America home, Asia's home. And we, we love the Asian people. Thank you, Pastor. Every day that passes. 
How about a round of applause for Brother Esposito there? Isn't that great? 
Church, church, I hope what you're seeing there is I hope that you're seeing th- that's your mission dollars at work. That's what that is. That, that, that's, a, that's a heavenly investment that you're making. A, a heavenly investment that you're making. And it's, it's bearing, bearing much fruit uh, to not only uh, Pastor Esposito's account, uh, but also to your account as you give. Uh, to the mission program of First Baptist Church. I'm, I'm looking around the room. I, I think Brother Esposito slipped onto the children's class. Is that right? Okay, Brother Carl, you give me the thumbs up there. So our missionaries are also going to make their way over to the children's uh, classes this morning, which we're so thankful for that. I love that our boys and girls get to meet uh, real-life superheroes, our missionaries. Real-life superheroes, our missionaries. Amen. And uh, our next missionary, and I'm, I'm just going to warn you at the very outset of this, my American accent is going to butcher his name, okay? Uh, but I am so thankful uh, to have Pastor Malad Khalid uh, with us in the service this morning. He is uh, a pastor of a church in Lebanon already. You're going to hear about that in just a moment. Uh, but the Lord is already using him to do a great work uh, there in Lebanon, and we are so thankful to have him with us. And uh, Pastor Malad, why don't you come and you uh, give a greeting to the church family and then tell us a little bit about the work there. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm so honored and pleased to be with you this morning. Um, I don't want to go back home. You spoiled me, Pastor. All the assistants, they've been taking me for lunch and dinner. <laughs> so probably I gained <coughs> 20 pounds so far. <laughs> so God bless you for taking care uh, of me while I'm here. Uh, I'm very blessed and touched. I feel like I'm, I'm with my family. Um, uh, secondly, Uh, Our ministry uh, goes beyond uh, Lebanon. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the online Bible school. Meanwhile, on the DVD, you're going to see everything. Um, Due to difficulties uh, for our students all over the Middle East to receive textbooks, so we were able to start our online Bible school. And what we're doing is we are taking all the English courses and translate it into Arabic, translate them into Arabic. And we put them online so students don't have to worry about their textbook. They just read and do the requirements. We are now halfway of what we are doing online. We still uh, need to translate the other half around 25 courses. And this costs a lot. And uh, that's why we visit churches asking them to be our partners and to be part and to invest, just like Pastor was saying. Could you imagine, like in heaven, you will see a pastor who went thousands to the Lord. Then you will n- you'll know that he studied through that online Bible school that you supported. Yeah. You are his, pa- his partner. Okay, so uh, the Lord is blessing. The Lord is doing wonderful things. One more thing. We're serving a very, in a very difficult part of the world. There is, there, are, there is persecution. Islam hates Christ, and they hate our churches. Uh, still, the Lord is opening a door. And he's sending a kind of war and, uh, and disturbances all over the Middle East so they will forsake about us. <laughs> and we're doing the job. And one more thing also, I would like to tell you that, uh, do you know that as Christians we're allowed to use dynamites? Really? I'm not, uh, please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Really? Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The word power here in the Greek uh, Greek, uh, language is, you know, Pastor, is dynamite. It's dynamite. They came to us with their bombs and terrorist attacks, so we went to them with the power of God. Amen. Amen. This is the changing word of God. And that's why all our life is focused on the word of God. So God bless you. You can see the video now.
travailler souvent. To jungles dark when deserts white Or will you go to Shad God's light? Or will you go to Shad God's word? For many still have never heard The fields are white, but the labor's few This time is gathering near, the Lord will come and soon appear. God's work of love must spread abroad to every race, on every sun. Oh, will you go to share God's word for many still? But the labor's few. Will you go? Can he count on you? If you reject the Savior's call, and yield to self, to Satan fall. Then men will die and never see the one who died to set them free. Or will you go to share God's word? For many still have never are white, but the labor's few. Will you go? Oh, will you go? Can he count on you? Take your Bibles this morning. Go with me to the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians in chapter number thir- chapter number four this morning. The book of Philippians in chapter number four. Philippians chapter four. We began this study uh, in chapter four three weeks ago now, and uh, we said really two things about the beginning part of this text. We said that it is first an understanding of a healthy church, and then we said second, it's the understanding of a healthy Christian. So what does it mean to be a a part of a church that's healthy and growing and vibrant? And what does it mean to be a a Christian 
who is also healthy and growing and vibrant. And you're going to see here what we've been talking about uh, just by way of demonstration through videos this morning. Uh, a, a healthy church is a church that focuses on the gospel of Jesus Christ. A healthy church is a church that focuses on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Philippians chapter 4, let's stand together out of respect for the reading of God's word. I'm going to read verse number 3 and verse number 4. I just want to be mindful of our time together this morning. First or uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 3 and verse 4. We said the very beginning of this study, we said a healthy church is one that stands fast in the Lord. They have a spiritual stability. Verse number one, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. We said second, which we talked about last week, a healthy church is one that resolves conflict in Christian love. They don't just ignore conflict. Uh, they aren't just contentious. But whenever there is conflict among God's people, they resolve it. And we said this in verse number two, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. So there was a, a disagreement between these uh, two women, Eodius and Syntyche. And the Apostle Paul gives their instruction on how we deal with conflict inside of the church. And now we come this morning to verse three, verse four, and we'll, let's read them together. The Bible reads, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other, my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say, rejoice. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would use your word in our hearts and lives, and in Jesus' name we pray. And all the church said together, amen. amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. There is a sense in which the Apostle Paul here is reminding us that there is something at stake in this particular endeavor that we are involved in. What, what are you saying and what he's already said? Just remind yourself of what he's already told us in chapter 3, chapter 2. He's told us that there are violent, hostile enemies of the cross who have a singular intent. And their intent is to lead people away from the gospel of Jesus. That's their goal. And what he's saying in this text is he's simply reminding us that eternity is what is at stake. Eternity is what is at stake. And he's saying that sometimes the church's discord and the church's infighting, which happens frequently, is used as a way to turn people away from the truth and toward lies, away from love and toward hate. And so Paul is reminding us here, he's reminding us that the infighting that takes place inside of the church can have a devastating effect on their testimony in front of those at Philippi and among those uh, with the Philippians. And he's telling them, everyone is watching you. That's what he's saying. They're watching you in this pagan culture which exists at Philippi. They're watching us just the same. And discord and disunity, conflict at the level that it was engaged in with the church at Philippi, has a devastating effect on the integrity of the church, and it's detrimental to the testimony of the gospel. That's what he's telling them. And he's saying that there is something that is at stake. So, so now notice he sees really four things in this text. Notice, look at the phrase in verse number three. Those women which labored with me, look at the phrase, in the gospel. Let me ask you a question. What is the gospel? Could you answer that? What is the gospel? So, so if we're truly going to be a church that focuses on the work of the gospel, we must be able, number one, to define the gospel. We must be able to define the gospel. So what is the gospel? Can I tell you this, that the Bible never crouches the gospel as a gospel. 
It's not as if the gospel of Jesus Christ is one of many paths that lead up the proverbial mountain to God. There is only one gospel. It's simply the gospel. Look at the text. He says, these women which labored with me in the gospel, the gospel. The gospel has been made available to us through Jesus Christ. So what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news found in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Go backwards with me to the book of Romans in chapter number 1. We studied this at the very beginning of our study in Romans a few years back now, but Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 1 and look at verse 2. Paul in these two passages, or or these few verses rather, is explaining to us, he's expounding to us his definition of the gospel. Here's what it says. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he, the he there is God, so which he had promised afore by his prophets, According to the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to faith among all nations for his name. You want to know what the gospel is? That is the gospel right there. The gospel is not simply a new religion. The the gospel is the fulfillment of an old religion. The gospel was prophesied and promised throughout the pages of the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi. The gospel was announced to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The gospel was believed by Abraham when he reached the promised land. The gospel was received by Moses on Mount Sinai. The gospel is pictured in the Levitical sacrificial system of the law. The gospel was proclaimed by the prophets to Israel. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is from God. He is God of both the Old and the New Testament. It's a way of saying that Christ was preached long before Christ ever showed up. Christ was preached long before Christ ever showed up. And now you have to ask yourself this question. Well, why did Christ need to show up? Why did he have to show up? And the answer according to the gospel is simple. The reason Christ must show up, the reason why Christ must come is because man is sinful. According to the scriptures, we are all sinners, every one of us. We are all guilty of sin. There is no man who has not sinned. It does not mean that you're incapable of performing a good work. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that man is incapable of human kindness. That's not what it means. When we say that man is inherently sinful, he's guilty of sin, what we are saying is we are incapable, hear me, We are incapable of understanding or loving or pleasing God on our own. That's what that means. It means you're incapable. Man is incapable of understanding, loving, or pleasing God on our own. So God sent his son, Jesus Christ, for sinful men, to die on the cross for sinful men. Now, why must Christ die? And here's the answer. Because God's holiness and God's justice demand that all sin be punished by death. For the wages of sin is death. The Bible says. So God sends Jesus into this world to fulfill his holiness and his justice. And that is why simply changing your behavior patterns... Uh, simply changing your attitude, uh, simply conquering your addiction. That is why it is not enough because none of those things can eliminate the problem of sin. The only way that the problem of sin can be eliminated is for it to be paid for. And the way that God intends for sin 
to be paid for was by sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sin and for mine. And that this message, the message of Christ on the cross for our sin, is believed in faith. So man is sinful. What's the, what's the gospel? The gospel is Christ came because man is sinful and in fulfillment to God's word. Paul did not come up with the message of the gospel. The prophets did not invent the message of the gospel. The church does not own the message of the gospel. It is the message of God. First, God. And then God gave a promise. And God desired to give his word to his prophets that by and through, those are, the, those are the words used in Romans 1, by and through the prophets, God chose to speak through them. And what, what they delivered to us were writings or the scriptures. That's why it's called the Holy Scriptures. That's why it's called the Holy Bible. It's because it's altogether different. The word holy literally means set apart from. It, these writings, the writings of the Bible are altogether different. They're set apart from, they're unique from any other set of writings, from any other message. Why? Because it is not simply the message of a man. It is the message of God that is why. The gospel is the message of God. It simply says that Jesus is Lord then. Hundreds of years go by after the prophets preach. And the Jews wonder, will the Messiah ever come? They go through this horrendous suffering. They're separated because of consequences of their own sin. And then Galatians chapter 4 teaches us that God acts. And God acts in accordance with his promise. And he does so at his own timing and in his own choosing. Galatians chapter 4 verse number 4. Simply means that God can be trusted may not look as if he can, but he can be. He, hear me, hear me, church. God does not forget his promises. There are not very many people in the world who are good for their word, but God is good for his word. That's what the message of Jesus is. So if you believe on the Lord Jesus, Romans chapter 10, and if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then thou shalt be saved. That's the message of the Bible. And even though God's justice demands death, Christ's death satisfied what God's justice demanded. And Christ's perfect life, sinless life, atoned, it satisfied God's holiness. And it thereby enabled Christ to forgive us of our sin and to save us and to save all of those who would place their faith and trust in him. Simply a way of saying that there's no way to be right with God apart from Jesus Christ. There's no other gospel, simply the gospel of Jesus Christ. By grace alone, through faith alone, Christ alone. So what is the gospel? Can you define it? Notice second though, th this idea here, that there are those who are laboring in the gospel. Look, look at the text. I'm in verse number, uh, verse number three of chapter four. It says, those women which labored with me in the gospel. So Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. What, what he meant by that was that all Christians, not just super spiritual Navy SEAL Christians, but that all Christians are called to leverage their lives, their abilities, and their opportunities for the sake of the gospel. All Christians are called to leverage their lives, their opportunities, for the sake of the gospel. That's what's happening in this text. You'll remember that there are these women who are in Philippi. The story is found in Acts chapter number 16. Paul goes to Philippi. There's no Jewish synagogue there. Paul's habit was always to go to the synagogue first. There isn't one there. And the reason there isn't one there is because there are not 11 Jewish men in the city. 
In order to have a synagogue, you had to have 11 Jewish men in order to make up the beginning of that synagogue. There aren't that many men there. And so these women are going outside of the city, and they're meeting beside the river, and they're praying. They're praying for a work of God. And so Paul goes out, and he meets these women outside of the city by the river, uh, two of which are Iodius and Syntyche, found in verse number two. And they begin, they begin to labor together for the sake of the gospel. Paul preaches Christ to them. They believe, and they were a part of that first group. And then from that first group, a church is birthed out of this movement. This is what, this is what Acts 16 teaches us. The idea here, the verb, labored, labored with me. That's a verb, the verb there, labored with me in the gospel, literally means they struggled with me in the gospel. It's where we actually get our word for athletics. He says they struggled with me. They, 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 they strived with me in the gospel. There was this diligent struggle that they had with me in getting out the gospel. I can tell you this. That nothing except the gospel of Jesus Christ, nothing except the gospel of Jesus Christ is strong enough to hold together the extraordinary diversity of the people in the church, especially during a time of extreme disunity in the culture. Nothing except the gospel of Jesus Christ is strong enough to hold together the extraordinary diversity of people inside of the church during a time of extreme disunity in our culture. You notice what's happening in the church here. It's men, it's women, it's young, it's old. There's CEOs, there's factory workers, there's educated, there's uneducated. There are the the sick, there are the healthy, there are the fit, there are the, the flabby. There are all kinds of people, a part of all kinds of different tribes or clans, all kinds of different incomes, all kinds of different levels of education, all kinds of different personalities. What holds them together? What holds us together? This is it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is what holds us together. We're sold out to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in being sold out to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can then be committed to each other. You cannot first make a commitment to each other. We first make our commitment to Jesus Christ. And in having made a commitment to Jesus Christ, we then make a commitment to all those who are his. This is why you can see what you're seeing by way of video this morning. You see the gospel going out all over Asia. You see the gospel going out all over the Middle East. Even even just... Just look around the tent this morning. Look at how different we all are. What is it that brings us together? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what it is. So what do we aim for? In laboring together with them in the gospel, what is it that we aim for? We aim for three things. I'm telling you something we've already studied, past tense, but I'm just going to remind you. There's three things we want from our missionaries. There's three things we want from those that we would support with our resources to go around the world and give out the gospel. Three things. Number one, new converts. Acts chapter 14, verse 21 says, and when they had preached the gospel in that city, when they had preached the gospel in that city, many believed. So we want our missionaries to take the gospel and to preach the gospel in cities around the world so that there will be those in those cities who will hear the gospel and who will believe. Second, not just new converts, but second, we want new churches. Verse 23 of Acts chapter 14, it says, and when they had ordained elders for them in every church. So we want new converts. We want new churches. Number three, We want our missionaries to nurture Christians. Verse 22 of that same text reads, confirming, which literally means strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith. So what does it mean to labor together in the gospel? It means we're supporting missionaries. We're supporting mission work who are doing what? They are seeing new converts. They are planting new churches, and they are nurturing Christians along the way. I will tell you why that's important. I'll tell you why that's important. I was talking to both of these missionaries before the service, and both of them said, you know, you know, Pastor, there'll, there'll come a time 
when in the Middle East, an American will not be welcome, and that time is probably already here. But there are those who are Middle Eastern who can take the meta message of the gospel into their own neighborhoods, into their own communities, and they will be received because they are a part of that people. And there is coming a time, and it's probably already here, when an American will not be welcomed in certain places in Asia with the message of the gospel. But there are those who are Asian who, if they will take the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they can plant churches. They can preach the gospel. They can see new converts. They can see new churches, and they can nurture those who have believed while they are there. You see what we are after? This is what we are after. This is the threefold understanding of what we're trying to do in the sake of evangelizing the world. We want to see new converts, we want to see new churches, and we want to see nurtured Christians. We want to see all of those leveraging all that they have for the sake of the gospel. Notice Paul says they, they partnered with me in the gospel. There's a partnering here. Notice they labored with me in the gospel. Notice this, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers. So, so you know what happened as a result of these ladies in that prayer meeting? Paul shows up, he preaches the gospel to them by the riverside, Acts chapter 16. They believe the church is planted. And then what happens from there is chapter 16, verse 11. You have a lady by the name of Lydia who believes the message of Jesus Christ and is saved. You have a slave girl in Acts 16, 16 who hears the message of Jesus, who has these fortune-telling abilities, and she believes Jesus. This uh, demon goes out of her, and her slave owners now are angry at Paul and Barnabas because they've, they've taken away their profitability by delivering the gospel of Jesus to her. There are, there's the jailer in Acts 16, verse 25. There's Epaphroditus. There's Clement. There's other. And now what do you see? You see this springing up of believers all around Philippi. And Paul is writing back 10 years later, and he's writing to a church at Philippi. You see, this is what it means to partner with the gospel. And Pastor Esposito said there were, even during the COVID restrictions, there was a church planted making four churches that his ministry has had the opportunity of teaching, training, nurturing nationals, first Christians, then nationals in order to go back into their own communities and preach the gospel. That happened under COVID restrictions. It is in this sense, this is what we are agreeing to do with our missionaries. We are agreeing to partner with them in the gospel. Listen, friend, they are agreeing to go with our support, and we are agreeing to support them. You see? They are agreeing to go. We are agreeing to support them. And so if you will not go, we must support. This is what it means to partner together in the gospel. If you will not go, well, then you must support. How do we do that? We do that a couple ways. First, we do that at our church primarily through faith promise giving. How many of you received the card, the faith promise card on your way in? It looks like this right here. You got this? Okay, so this is the way in which we determine as a church how we will support missions. This is, this is the way we determine it. We determine it individually. That you ought to be straightway convicted and convinced of God for what you ought to do for the sake of evangelizing the world. So what we're, here's what we're saying. We're not saying, well, let's just leave it up to some other board or some other commission. Let's just leave it up to some other institution. No, what we're saying is this responsibility of taking the gospel around the world falls to the churches. And as a result of it falling to the churches, it falls to the individuals who make up the church. Remember, we've said the church isn't a building, the church isn't stone, the church isn't brick. What's the church? The church is people. The church is individuals. So the church is not a place that you go in. The church is a people that you are with. And so if the responsibility of taking the gospel to the globe belongs to the church, well then, who is the church? We are. Okay, so now we say, okay, so as the church... What will we do in order to see to it that the gospel is taken around the globe? Will you go? Okay, so if you will not go, 
Which, by the way, some of you ought to say yes to that question. So if you will not go, then we will give. Okay, so, so how will you give? What will you give? That's what faith promises. Faith promises them making a commitment to say, here are men who are willing to go. Here are men who have the ability, the opportunity. They're leveraging their lives and their livelihoods for the sake of going. So here's what we will do to support them in going. These two represent 110 missionaries. Is my number right, Ms. Norma? 110 missionaries that our church supports uh, with, with or through the Faith Promise Missions Department of our, of our church. We're committing ourselves to do this. That's what's happening here. It's faith promise. Second, it's by way of seminaries and Bible colleges. You witnessed the effects of that this morning. You saw two men who have uh, began in their particular areas of ministry, uh, Bible colleges, institutions, seminaries, which what are they doing? They're teaching and they're training nationals. They're providing them with resources necessary to be shored up with in the gospel so that they might be able to go and preach. You see that? So what are we doing? We're saying this is, this is the kind of work we want to support. We want to support the kind of work where they're duplicating. Oh, they're nurturing these Christians. They're taking these new believers. They're giving them the message of the gospel. They're, they're rooting it deep inside of them that they might be able to go out and teach others also. Commit to faithful men so that these faithful men might be able to go out and teach others also. So we're partnering with them in this way. Let me tell you a third way that you can do this. You can do this by joining us on a mission trip. Lord willing, in 2021, we'll be going to Costa Rica. We were supposed to do that in 2020. Obviously, that got canceled along with everything else. But in 2021, Lord willing, we'll be joining Brother Bordell in Costa Rica. I want you to go with us. So we'll have five, 600 children inside of, a, uh, inside of their services that week, all in need of the gospel. We'll have the opportunity to give it. You should go. It'll be a week or two long. You should partner with us and go. There's, there's a fourth idea here. A fourth idea. How can you do it? Here, here's how. Take a short-term mission trip. Perhaps you have the resources. Perhaps you have the opportunity. Perhaps you have the ability to go to a country and partner with a missionary or a church planter and begin giving out the gospel in a short-term effect. Some of you who are retired, you should take the first two years of your retirement and you should go someplace and you should partner with a, a missionary or a church planter and you should help them give out the gospel why not well i'm retired i just want to just want to get some golf in no 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 remember what he's saying he's saying there's something at stake here eternity is at stake eternity is at stake i'll give you a, 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 a fifth idea faith promise bible college institutions seminaries mission trips short-term trips here's another one Take an overseas position with your company. What? Leave the comfort of, well, I'm not for sure how comfortable America will be for very much longer, number one. But number two, why not? Why not take an overseas position with your company? Find a church, support them, serve with them. You enter into some of these cultures and some of these customs, and just by default, you, would, you have forgotten so much more Bible than most people around the globe even know. You could be such a help to that missionary. You could be such a help to that church planner. You say, Pastor, what are you trying to do? You're trying to get people to leave First Baptist Church of Long Beach? We're trying to get people to stay. No, no, listen, listen, here. A church is not measured... A church is not measured by its seeding capacity. A church is measured by its sending capacity. What makes a church great is not how many seats does it have. What makes a church great, biblically speaking, is how many people is it sending into the world. So there are some of you, your, your companies, it would afford you this opportunity. It would afford you this chance. You should take it. Go, partner, serve, help, invest. Eternity is at stake. Look at the last one. Last point, the impact of the gospel. See how the verse ends? See how the verse ends? The verse ends this way, whose names are in the book of life. You see that? Whose names are in the book of life. There is no mission more important 
than the Great Commission. There is no mission more important than the Great Commission. And the reason that is true is because eternity is at stake. So here's my question for you in closing. The question is no longer if you will leverage your life for the Great Commission. The question is only how and where. That's the question. The question is not if you will. The question is how and where. How and where. I'll ask you a more personal question. Are you involved in the work of the gospel right now? You say, well, Pastor, I'm not a missionary. I don't, I don't go around the globe giving out, giving, out the, giving out the gospel. I'm not serving in that kind of culture. No, no, it doesn't matter. Do you know Christ? Have you believed the gospel? Well, then you're on his team. And there's no bench warmers when it comes to the cause of evangelizing the world. No, God has gifted you. God has placed you. And God has gifted you and placed you with a specific purpose of giving out the gospel wherever you are, in whatever environment you find yourself in. Ask God for courage. Ask God for boldness. You know what's interesting? None of the ladies mentioned in, in Philippians chapter 4, none of them have a seminary degree. And yet, what does Paul say? Paul says, they're laboring with me in the gospel. We're partnering to get together in order to give out the gospel, which is having an eternal impact. So I'm, I'm asking you this question. Not if you will leverage your life, your opportunities, your abilities for the gospel. Not if you will, but how will you? How will you? Where will you? Personally, I believe a church like First Baptist Church of Long Beach is a great place to do this at. I think of all the different cultures. I think of all the different people groups that come into our city. And by way of coming into our city, into our church, I, I, can, I can name dozens. I can name dozens of individuals who've they've been in our city for a while. They've gotten training. They've gotten education. They've gone back to their communities. They've gone back to their cities. They've gone back to their countries. And they're now giving out the gospel in great ways there. I can think of dozens just in the amount of time that I've been here, much less, much less the 126-year history of this church. This is a great investment in the sake of evangelizing the world by supporting the local church. But that is not all that we must do. We must do more. Not if, how. Not if, how, and where. Where will you sink your energy, your effort, your time? Look at me. Where will you sink your life? To say, I want it not to just make a living. I want it to make an eternal difference. God has given you unique opportunities. God has opened specific doors. God has placed you in companies with education, resources, and abilities. God has given all of this to you for the sake of the gospel. But we must lift our eyes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's take them off of each other in the disunity here and now. The gospel of Jesus Christ is strong enough to hold us together. You see it? A healthy church is focused on what? The work of the gospel around the world. The work of the gospel around the world. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, use your word in our hearts and lives. And in Jesus' name we pray. All the church said together. Amen. Let me, give you, let me give you some homework. You got this card? How many of you got it? Let me see it. Hold it up. I'm already late, so you got to do it quick. If you don't do it, yeah, I'm just going to make you sit there. And the folks in the back are in the sun. They're not liking it right now. Okay. okay. So, so this right here, this card is your homework assignment. If you already know, if you already know what the Lord would have you to do for the sake of faith promise missions or your faith promise mission commitment, then you can go ahead and fill this card out. Here's a little dotted line. You're going to fold it and you're going to tear it. Please make it a clean tear. I don't care. I went on just to fold it. You don't put your name on it anywhere. It's, this commitment is not between you and the church. This commitment is between you and the Lord. Do you understand? The church makes the commitment to the missionaries. We're going to support our missionaries. You make the commitment to the Lord. 
So whatever the Lord has you to do, now you fulfill your commitment to him. You fulfill your commitment to the Lord. If you want, if you want that lesson, you can read 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 8, chapter 9, about what it means to make a promise to the Lord and now fulfill the obligation that you've made. So this, this commitment, you're, there's no place for your name, but you'll just you'll fold it, you'll tear it. This, this bottom half, the, where you put your amount, you're going to drop that in the offering bag on your way out if you're ready to do that. If you are not ready to make your faith promise commitment this week, you can bring this next week. But we need you to bring it either, uh, put it in today if you're prepared. If you're not prepared to do this today, then we need you to put it in by next week. Everybody understand? Th this is the way in which we will evaluate what we can do for missions this coming year. You understand? This is the way that we'll evaluate. We'll say, okay, here's what we can do for the sake of evangelizing the world. Here's what we can give toward our missions giving for this year. All 110 of our missionaries have been fully supported for this entire year, and that is a direct result of your faithfulness to faith promise giving. I, I've heard so many churches, I've heard testimony of so many churches and so many missionaries who've either had to come off of the field because their church could no longer fulfill their faith promise commitments, and those missionaries could not stay where they had agreed to go, and that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. So praise the Lord, First Baptist Church has fulfilled 100% for 100% of, of all of our missionaries, and we funded them 100% of the way. And we, we want to be able to continue to do that, but the way that we do this is through the faith promise giving. You got it? Everybody understand? Okay. Now, now if, if, you, if, if you're new to faith promise commitment, you're saying, I'm not really for sure I know what the, exactly what that is, you can have a conversation with myself or one of our pastors afterwards. Faith promise commitment is simply the way in which, as a church, we will, will see to the evangelization of the world. Every church has to figure out its own way, some churches never take a time to figure out a way, and so you know what they ends up happening for the sake of evangelizing the world? Nothing. Nada. Zip. Zero. Zilch. W what other word can I use for zero, okay? They end up doing nothing because they never take any time to consider it. So what Faith Promise does for us is every year at this time, we come back to the table and we go, okay, now let's think about this, church. What will we do to evangelize the world? I can tell you this right now. When we all stand in front of heaven, when we all stand in front of God in heaven, I don't want to be the pastor that saved up a million dollars in the bank and we were safe. And nothing was going to upset our little kingdom. Nothing was going to take away our building. Meanwhile, people around the globe needed the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, I want to take all that we have as a church and I want to leverage it for the sake of reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You understand? Okay, well, when I got to do that, it makes me really not believe it, okay? Like, if I have to ask you, do you love me? Well, then you don't really love me, all right? We want to take all of that, I'll give you a second chance, and we want to leverage it for the gospel. That was better. That's a lot better. That's a lot better that time. I, I felt, it felt more sincere that way, all right? Brother Carl has an announcement for us, I'm sure. And uh, if you're here this morning, you're visiting with us, please meet us here at the back. And my wife and I would love to meet you and greet you. Thank you so much for being in attendance this morning. Carl, you make our announcement. And if you have not received a Faith Promise Commitment card behind Pastor Candyline, go ahead and help yourself and claim one of these and be ready to turn that in next week, if not today. First Baptist Church, our connection groups meets tonight. And if you are not currently in a connection group, you are a person, visit fbclb.org for a list of connection groups for you to attend. Mrs. Wheeler's Faithful Ladies and Brother Smith's uh, uh, graceful ladies and Brother Smith's friend meet at 5 p.m. tonight. Meet with Pastor and Mrs. Amanda live on Facebook on uh, this Tuesday at 10 a.m. And then we will have 7 p.m. Teenagers, this Saturday we will have a youth activity at Bolsa Chica Beach. It's a beach cookout. Any questions? per person meet here on campus at 1 p.m. First Baptist Church, if you are a visitor here, at first, uh, uh, thank you for attending our outdoor services. Meet with Aaron and Yancey at our guest services table. They have a special uh, gift for you. And then church family, please be sure to visit our missionary table to pick up our prayer cards for our missionaries. Thank you very much. You are dismissed.